very happy today to have Don Rogers with us. Uh, uh, Don Don is a member of the University of Texas in Austin. A master's degree in physics and chemistry from MIT, and then a PhD in physical chemistry from MIT. Um, when was that? 1995. And then was a junior fellow at Harvard and was in the genetic matter physics division at Bell Labs, including the director of that division. So he moved to the University of Illinois when I was in 2002. He was there for quite a while until last year, where he very recently moved to the Northwestern University, where he is primarily in the material science and engineering department, but is in whatever 16 other <laughs> There and is most significantly the founding director of the new Center for Biointegrated Electronics at Northwestern. Um, John has won, if I were to read all of his awards, he wouldn't have any time left to talk afterwards, as I mentioned. Um, he got the Manal Medal from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Institute for Medical and Bio. Logical Engineering Fellow, it's Electrically Engineering and Medicine Biology Society Trailblazer Award. He uh, was elected the Electoral Board of Disease and National Academy of Sciences uh, to the Texas Institute for Advanced Study at Texas A&M. Those are all within the last year. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the IEEE, the Charles Research Society, National Academy of Adventures, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Engineers, um, the National Academy of um, um, The one that I like to point out is he won the MacArthur Fellowship for the so-called Genius Grant, so he was a certified genius. <laughs> <laughs> He's found, I think, six startup companies? Oh, something like that, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, between those and large companies, he has over 50 patents currently licensed. Uh, he's published over 500 papers that have over 75,000 citations. Uh, and he will be telling you today about yeah, great. Okay. Thanks a lot, Matt, for that uh, introduction and for the invitation. I've really enjoyed my visit here out of uh, really young uh, faculty members, new new programs, a lot, lot of interesting things going on. So I'll look forward to the next few meetings that I have after this talk. But, it, but it's been a great visit and, uh, you know, it's an honor and pleasure to have a chance to share with you some of the things that we've been working on, you know, over the last uh, five, six years, I guess. Um, it's very it's sort of interdisciplinary work, so uh, it's not traditional traditional physics uh, by any means, uh, maybe applied physics or engineering physics with a heavy dose of material science and biomedical engineering, some various things, and um, trying to kind of have an overall impact in, in the way that we think about um, you know, how to integrate engineered systems in general and optoelectronic devices in particular uh, with the human body. And uh, there are uh, potential outcomes that have um, you know, uh, impacts in uh, human health care, clinical medicine, uh, but also some of these uh, tools could be useful in advancing our basic understanding of how the brain works, for example. And uh, and that's the interface I'll focus on in the next, uh, you know, 45 or 50 uh, minutes is, um, you know, how do you take, you know, optoelectronic uh, components that exist today in consumer gadgetry and telecommunications hardware and so on uh, and adapt them through new ideas in material science and mechanical engineering, electrical uh, engineering to, to enable uh, chronic, long-term, you know, intimate interfaces with the surface surfaces or the depths of the brain. And um, you know, being able to do that uh, allows you to uh, uh, provide uh, various kinds of functionality that, again, are, are relevant to human health and, uh, and neuroscience uh, research. And the uh, talk will sort of break out into three different uh, sections. This is very much kind of a high-level overview of some concepts that we've been uh, pursuing, just to kind of give you a flavor of uh, you know the possibilities that are, that are beginning to emerge from this uh, broader broader uh, area of activity. The first uh, focuses on the development of soft, mechanically soft. Uh, conformal or ultra miniaturized um, optoelectronic uh, systems. The the second topic is in uh, thinking about uh, devices that go beyond kind of a planar thin film type architecture to something that is more extended in a 3D volumetric sense to to enable a higher level of uh, interfacing, uh, you know, with with the three dimensional tissues uh, of the brain. And then the last one is is a little bit different, complementary to these two, but but distinct from them in the sense that we're um, developing 
building a baseline of materials that allow us to build optoelectronic and electronic devices whose key defining unique characteristic is that they're water soluble. Uh, and in fact, uh, water soluble to biocompatible end products. And so they become sort of bioresorbable in, in, in terms of their uh, lifetime and their, their interface with the body. I'll describe you know, the capabilities that we have in that area and um, you know, some, some potential modes of use that, that open up new, new opportunities in, uh, in clinical medicine. So anyway, that's, that's a long-winded overview, but just give you a sense, it'll be three topics and we'll step through them uh, fa fairly quickly. Uh, but as Matt mentioned, uh, you know, one of the things that we have at Northwestern is this new center for biointegrated electronics. I'm going to focus on the brain interface, but I want to point out that a lot of the ideas that I'll step you through um, equally apply to other organ systems uh, in the body. Uh, and um, it's not just for the brain, but uh, other areas of focus for us are on the uh, cardiovascular system, the heart in particular, uh, and uh, on the body's largest organ uh, system, the, the skin. Uh, and so uh, as skin-mounted, uh, uh, heart-interfaced, and brain-interfaced uh, devices, you know, this, this is the, the scope of... Um, activity that we have. So, so the brain uh, serves maybe as the most natural motivation for um, you know, the overarching goals that, that, that we have in mind, which, which is really to uh, acknowledge that, that the brain is uh, biology's most sophisticated form of electronics. And if you want to understand the fundamental operating principles of the brain, if you want to deliver new kinds of therapies to treat brain disorders, it might make sense to think about how we can leverage man's most sophisticated form of electronics in that context. And that is silicon CMOS integrated circuits. How, how could you sort of reformulate that class of technology to look more like biology from the standpoint of the geometrical configuration, the mechanics, and so on? So, so how do we take an integrated circuit chip and laminate it on the textured surfaces of the brain down into the sulci between the inner hemispheric fissures in, in a soft conformal way that can uh, you know, accommodate the natural micro motions of the brain to enable a long-term stable but physically intimate interface for exchange, exchange of information, stimulation, measurement, uh, and so on. And so that challenge essentially uh, from a pictorial standpoint looks, looks like this. So, so th this is extremely well developed you know, technology platform uh, as a result of a half century worth of global you know, R&D. Tremendous levels of functionality. The operating principles are different, but it's an electronic system that could in principle you know, tell us a lot of things about uh, you know, the electrical functionality of the brain if it weren't for the fact that you have this dramatic qualitative mismatch in geometries. This is planar, flat. Uh, this is textured, uh, obviously. This is a very high modulus uh, platform. Silicon has a modulus of 150 gigapascals. Brain tissue, maybe 5 to 10 kilopascals. So, so dramatically uh, different. And so it sets up the, the challenge. You know, the question in, in terms of materials is how do you uh, recast this to look like uh, the brain in, in in, in a sense, and um, you know the, that that challenge in in geometry and mechanics has been addressed over the last 15 or 20 years by using this kind of platform. It's a Utah array, so it's referred to, and it's been the workhorse for neuroscience research in terms of uh, studying and stimulating electrical activity in the brain, and it solves the ge geometry mismatch uh, in the following way. So instead of uh, trying to interface this flat chip directly with the uh, brain, you mount it onto a flat platform, uh, the opposite side of which consists of these micro-machine pins uh, made out of doped silicon uh, that upon uh, application of a, a tool referred to as an air hammer penetrates into the surface of the brain and these pins can uh, penetrate to different depths and so by consequence you can take a planar chip and interface it with with a textured surface uh, sort, sort of in that way and um, it seems like kind of a crude approach but but it turns out to work reasonably well and like I said it has been the workhorse for the last 15 or 20 years but obviously it has disadvantages one is you're doing damage to the brain tissue during the insertion uh, process and and what tends to be even worse is that um, you know, the interface between these pins and the brain tissue is not stable uh, over long periods of time because um, you, know, you have a mechanical mismatch. Now you, you have a hard pin of a rigid material sitting in a bowl of jello that, that moves around you know, as, as respiration occurs and blood flow occurs and there's motion in the intracranial space. And so that, that difference in modulus uh, becomes problematic.
you know, over over time. And so, so what you'd like to do, you know, in the future is move away from a solution like this to one that uh, looks like this. So, so how do you create integrated circuit systems, optoelectronics that are mechanically soft, shape conformal, and built out of biocompatible materials to afford that kind of um, interface between this abiotic system and the biotic uh, system re represented by, by, by the brain. And why, why would you want to do this? And I think there are um, sort of two levels of motivation. I already touched on both of them, but let me just lend credibility to uh, the first one of which, um, you know, by, by uh, you know, citing famous physicists to, you know, observe that, you know, new directions in science are often launched by new tools uh, off, uh, more often than, than by new concepts. And so in that, in that framework of new tools, you know, maybe these kinds of soft biocompatible electronic devices could, could play that kind of role. And uh, it's not just physicists, but biologists as well sort of hold that vision. And this is uh, a quote from Todd Insel, who's basically saying the same things, so, uh, a program manager at, uh, at NIH. And so, so new tools for, for doing neuroscience research, but also there are immediate opportunities that one could envision in clinical medicine as it's practiced today. And this is just, just one, one example, uh, just to illustrate the point. So if, um, you know, a patient suffers from an acute form of epilepsy, non-responsive uh, to drugs, the current uh, surgical procedure to address that condition involves opening up the intracranial space, exposing the brain, and then laminating onto the surface of the brain passive arrays of electrodes. These are not electronic systems, just passive electrodes. Each electrode has a wire that connects to an external box of data acquisition uh, electronics, and you simply monitor the electrical activity on the surface of the brain over a given period of time uh, and capture the spatiotemporal pattern of electrical uh, behavior uh, as the patient is undergoing a seizure. And a trained surgeon from that kind of information can determine which region of the brain is centrally responsible for the seizure. Once that's determined, um, the uh, mapping electrode array is peeled off and uh, that part of the brain is simply removed by surgical resection. And so you can imagine if, if that's the, the diagnostic function of that type of platform, you'd like to have as much spatial resolution as possible. And this kind of architecture does not scale very effectively because uh, you quickly run out of room for wires. And so if you could replace this passive array of electrodes with a piece of real electronics with embedded multiplexing functionality, local amplification, you could go from a few tens of electrodes to a few million, you know, in principle. And so if you could do that, then, then that would uh, you know, greatly enhance the precision with which you could identify uh, the region of the brain that needs to be resected. And that is just one example of a surgical diagnostic function that this kind of brain integrated electronics might, might serve. And, and there, there are many other uh, examples uh, as well. And so the question is, how do you do it? And, um, you know, in some ways, it's, it's a material science question. You know, what, what are you going to use for a semiconductor for the, a, a bio compatible you know, for, form of electronics. And um, you might think about, you know, the field effect mobility as a metric by which you could run comparisons for different candidate materials. And this is sort of a set of values in centimeter square per volt second and kind of a logarithmic illustration. And what I've done is a split out, you know, maybe some candidate materials you might immediately think about in terms of uh, materials compositions, carbon-based systems or inorganics. And you may be drawn to sort of polymers or plastic-based semiconductors of which there are you know a few dozen that that are known from the last you know 25 uh, years of research on on uh, you know organic uh, semiconductors and and you might think well the polymers will be naturally sort of mechanically compatible with biological tissues and and that that might be true at some you know basic level but but the problem is that in spite of a lot of research on on polymer semiconductors the the performance metrics that you can uh, achieve are, are rather modest so so you can do very simple things in electronics but you couldn't do a microprocessor or radio it's just just outside of the scope of uh, the transport characteristics provided by these classes of uh, materials. As you move to small molecule, polycrystalline uh, thin films or single crystals of organics, you get a little better, maybe by one or two orders of magnitude, but you're still a couple orders of magnitude worse than what you can do with uh, conventional monocrystalline silicon, much worse than gallium arsenide. If you think about optimal bonding configuration for carbon in terms of uh, charge transport, maybe carbon nanotubes would, would be best, but 
still relatively immature as electronic material. There's no real established uh, pathways for taking tubes and building sophisticated uh, functions. So, so from a research standpoint, still may, may be interesting, but a long way to go. Graphene I just put on here for uh, sake of completeness. I don't see any role for it in this context because it's a semi-metal, but there was a lot of uh, hype around graphene and uh, you know its potential to replace uh, silicon. So I put it put it here for completeness. So the, so those are the things you can think about. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you could figure out a way to use silicon in this kind of bio biocompatible form, that, that would probably be the ideal way to go if you want to accelerate uh, the translation of a, of a technology into, into sort of a realistic uh, mo mode of use. Silicon would be attractive because uh, the basic science around silicon is very well known. Again, half century of global R&D around you know, the physics of silicon and uh, you know, the manufacturing infrastructure, quite frankly, that allow you to take silicon and build uh, you know, very, very high performance devices in, in a cost competitive uh, way. But you know, Silicon at an intuitive level may seem radically inappropriate uh, for these kinds of applications simply because um, you know the, the form that it conventionally exists in as a support for you know electronic devices is uh, in in this kind of wafer based uh, platform and um, you know it's great for uh, manufacturing of integrated circuits very flat and so it's compatible with the kind of optical techniques that are used for manufacturing it's very dimensionally stable which is good for multiple uh, level lithography and overlay registration and so on, but from uh, a brain interface uh, standpoint, it has these uh, you know hu huge uh, disadvantages, as as I mentioned uh, to you before. And so, so naively, you might conclude silicon is not going to work. But but it's really you know only accurate to say silicon in the form of a wafer uh, won't work. Uh, and it turns out that there are ways to sort of recast uh, silicon, redeploy it in in different geometrical forms, allow you to bypass a lot of those uh, limitations from from the standpoint of mechanics and geometry. And really sort of two uh, con concepts here and I would just hi highlight those just very trivial uh, physics but but with um, you know really important uh, implications and so if you think about silicon not in the form of wafers but in the form of these ultra thin membranes so maybe 20 nanometers in thickness 50 nanometers kind of in that realm it really uh, changes the way you think about the material from, from a, an intuitive mechanical standpoint simply because of a very simple physics uh, scaling laws. So if you think about the bending stiffness of any materials, dependent on the intrinsic Young's modulus, the mechanical properties of that material, it also depends on the geometry, in particular the thickness. So the bending stiffness decreases like the cube of the thickness. So when you go from a wafer, you know, that might have a thickness of one millimeter to a silicon nanomembrane, which might have a thickness of 10 to you know 100 nanometers because of that cubic thickness uh, scaling of the bending uh, stiffness uh, you decrease that that parameter the flexural rigidity by maybe 14 15 orders of magnitude uh, and that is just Newtonian elementary you know uh, classical mechanics but again you change any kind of physical parameter by 15 orders of magnitude it really changes the way you think about the material so silicon nanomembranes are in fact very very bendable uh, in the sense of having a low bending stiffness they can also also bend to a very tight radius of curvature because of another uh, attribute in thickness scaling, which is that the peak strains associated with bending a slab of material like that to a given radius of curvature R decrease linearly with the thickness. Now, silicon fractures at about a 1% tensile strain, so you can bend a silicon nanomembrane to a very tight radius of curvature without reaching that fracture level. Uh, and so, as a consequence of that thickness scaling, you know, silicon nanomembranes are floppy and they're flexible. But you can't really think about them as a direct replacement for a silicon wafer because it doesn't provide the kind of mechanical robustness as a substrate support for a device. So you have to think about it more as a building block material that you would integrate onto a substrate of interest, which for biointegration might be a sheet of plastic, for example, or a slab of rubber. And so in that case, you're thinking about extreme heterogeneous materials integration of a hard, low CTE, inorganic material like silicon and a soft, low modulus elastomer like silicone rubber. And if you think about the practical difficulties of gluing a chip of silicon onto a piece of rubber, uh, you appreciate that that's not uh, necessarily a triv trivial uh, interface to manage from, from the standpoint of adhesion. But here again, so uh, the sc uh, thickness scaling comes to your rescue because the uh, mechanics are such that the energy release rate parameter G, which defines the propensity for a crack to, deform, to form between two dissimilar materials, in this case driven by change in temperature 
in a mismatch and coefficient of thermal expansion coefficient scales down linearly with thickness. So what that means is that as you make the material thinner and thinner, the energy release rate uh, decreases linear, linearly, making it easier and easier from a practical standpoint to uh, manage the adhesion at that interface. So you go from a silicon wafer to a silicon nanomembrane. Again, you save several orders of magnitude because of that scaling, and by consequence, it becomes very easy to bond silicon to silicone. And this is just a vis visual example of that basic concept. So this is a, uh, a plate of silicon that we've printed onto a micro-machined uh, ridge on a piece of plastic. There's no adhesive material at all at that interface, just Van der Waals interactions, but they're sufficiently strong to keep that thing in a cantilevered sort of geometry. So, so silicon nanomembranes are in interesting because they're flexible, uh, they're, they're floppy, and they're sticky at, at, some, uh, at some level. And so if you take that kind of idea, then it becomes a question where are you going to get the silicon nanomembranes? And it turns out there are materials, etchants, that will allow you to slice very thin but highly uh, uh, perfect from a crystallographic standpoint sheets or ribbons of silicon off of a silicon wafer. So it turns out you can do that. I won't get into the details, but, but it's very straightforward. So you have a sort of a, a device grade class of uh, silicon in ultra thin format. Still thick enough to support all the kind of electronic functionality you need, but thin enough to offer these uh, kind of attributes and mechanics and uh, adhesive uh, properties. So that, that gets you flexible. But flexible is not good enough for biointegration because if you think about a flexible device, like on a sheet of uh, plastic, you can bend it so you can conform to simple geometric shapes like cylinders and cones, but you can't do spheres without in introducing uh, folds or, and kinks. And you certainly can't do brains or hearts. You need something that not only bends, but also stretches in the sense that uh, it supports an elastic mechanics to large strain deformation. And there's no thickness that you can take silicon to that will create a stretchable mechanics. It requires a separate idea and a composite material approach. Uh, as illustrated here, and I won't get into the details, it's pretty simple conceptually. You take these very thin sheets or ribbons of silicon, you bond them to an underlying silicone substrate, as I was suggesting in the previous slide, but you bond them not in a flat geometry, you bond them in a wavy, buckled sort of shape. Uh, and by doing that, you cre essentially create a hard, soft, deterministic composite structure that provides the electronic functionality, the hard brittle component, and the elastic um, you know, mechanics associated with the uh, underlying substrate with an overall combined mechanics that's very um, conceptually similar to that of an accordion bellow. So I can take this structure and I can stretch it out without breaking the silicon because I can, play, uh, I can trade off in-plane deformations for out-of-plane dimensional change. So I stretch this thing, the amplitudes of these wavy structures structures go down, the wavelengths go up in a way that uh, has a purely elastic, effective modulus. So that, that's the concept. It turns out you can do a lot with those basic ideas in mechanics and materials and composite design. I won't go through uh, any more details around how you take those ideas and build them out into uh, systems, but, then, but instead just transition uh, into, into the final systems to give, give you a sense of what's possible. So this is an active uh, piece of electronics that provides that kind of surface spatiotemporal sort of electrical mapping functionality that I was referring to uh, in a previous slide slide in the form of those passive uh, electrode arrays. These are qualitatively different because they involve not only the uh, electrode interface to the, to the adjacent tissue, but an underlying backplane of silicon nanomembrane uh, electronics that supports the switching and amplification functionality that you need to make these uh, systems work in a scalable way. So each unit cell has two silicon MOSFETs uh, as, as a key active component uh, of how the system works. There's a buffer that's providing amplification on the uh, a voltage reading that, you, that you're collecting here, and a multiplexer that, that avoids the need for a pair of wires going to every channel in the system. So now I just need row and column address lines, and I can scale this architecture to millions of uh, uh, probing lo locations in that way. And by exploiting the kind of mechanical principles I mentioned uh, previously, you can really render this kind of device in any kind of um, you know, geometry or, or set of mechanics that you want. So you roll them up and you put them in a tube. You can wrap them around a soft uh, insert and create a probing structure that allows you to even measure electrical activity in hidden interfaces such uh, as those associated with the inner hemispheric fissure or down into the sulci of the brain. So here's an example of one of these devices being evaluated uh, on a feline model of epilepsy uh, in a collaboration that we have with uh, folks at University of Pennsylvania's 
these uh, epilepsy uh, centers. So they have a colony of epileptic cats and you can do these kinds of experiments and you can uh, use this, this advanced functionality to do spatiotemporal mapping at um, you know, unmatched resolution. You can also, as I mentioned, you know, fold these things in half and then do, do mapping down, down into the inner hemispheric fissure as, as illustrated in that slide. So here's some data that shows you, uh, you know, what kind of measurements that you can make you know, in, this, in this type of platform in the relative length scale. So this is a color rendering of uh, patterns of electrical activity associated with a seizure. This is output from a, a single representative ch uh, channel in this overall array. And here we've uh, artificially induced a seizure by um, uh, use of a pharmacological agent, uh, picrotoxin. So we induce the seizure here. We see a lot of uh, anomalous electrical activity in this spatiotemporal map. You see it here in this single channel extracted from that map. The actual physical seizure doesn't set in until about a second and a half later, corresponding to this repeated sort of um, uh, periodic trace in this individual channel reflected in this recurring spiral wave instability that you see moving around uh, in this way. So from the clinical utility, you can use these maps to identify the anomalous region of the brain for extraction. From a research tool standpoint, this provides new information on the basic physiology of uh, epilepsy, for example. Because what, what this shows in, in this particular case is, is a remarkably repetitive uh, electrical signature uh, associated with the seizure and then magic it sort of just annihilates itself and disappears for reasons that nobody understands about five and, uh, and a half seconds uh, later. And so, so this, this uh, uh, tool, you know, uh, enables insights that, you know, that weren't possible previously just, just due to the kind of spatial and temporal resolution that, that, that's possible. So I should point out, you know, we published a few papers. This was back in uh, 2011. The biggest problem with these uh, platforms is that it's very difficult to keep biofluids out of the biased uh, electrical backplane. That's a key essential feature of these devices because if biofluids penetrate in, then immediately you have a leakage path, uh, path for current to flow into the surrounding uh, tissue, which is, which is a big problem. And so I won't go through it, but we spent almost half a decade working on materials that would allow almost perfect impenetrable layers um, that would prevent uh, biofluid uh, ingress uh, in, in that way. It turns out to be highly uh, non-trivial because you need to do that in submicron thick films. But you can, in fact, do it. We've done it. I won't tell, tell you the details, but we, now we have uh, deployments of devices in animal models that are uh, providing stable functionality for more than a year now, and we're um, working on non-human primates uh, as well. So that, that's kind of, kind of where this is going. Let me transition, though, into topic number two, which is, uh, you know, thinking about these same ideas in the context not just of electronics, but optoelectronic functionality, both light emission and light detection. And the uh, concepts I mentioned in terms of the mechanics scaling and the thickness and the composite design and so on apply obviously not just to silicon, but pretty much any material. And in fact, any kind of brittle um, electronic material that, that you might want to think about. And this is an example of using those same kind of ideas in the context of indium gallium nitride, which allows to create uh, LEDs with unprecedentedly small dimensions. And uh, the kind of release uh, etching uh, approaches that we use are related to those for silicon, a little bit different. But in any case, we can take active materials grown on silicon substrates, and then instead of using a, a dicing saw to basically cut up the whole wafer and then a pick and place tool to move the, the components around in the way that you would usually uh, process uh, LEDs, we can shave off the near surface of the wafer just the active stuff. Stuff, just the active 3.5 uh, materials, get rid of the wafer, and then manipulate these kind of devices in various ways to allow their integration on any kind of substrate of interest at sufficiently thin geometries that we can just do lithographic patterning of metal instead of wire bonding to do the interconnects. And that, that turns out to be a, a critical feature. And instead of a lateral resolution of the devices being set by the precision of a dicing saw or a dicing laser, now is defined by lithography. The photolithographic processes that are used, uh, you know, in semiconductor manufacturing. So we can scale down to much, much tinier devices than are uh, possible commercially. So this is a typical commercial uh, LED size that you would find in a flashlight or a headlight or so. These are the kinds of devices that we'll typically build. Actually, much smaller than that uh, as well, but sort of cellular scale in their dimensions. So the overall device sizes can be comparable to an individual neuron, you know, in, in the brain, and with a sufficiently small thickness that we can process 
process the system uh, just using thin film uh, te techniques, very, very scalable way to do interconnect. So it's one of these tiny devices. We can planarize it with a, with a, a polymer coating. We can open up contacts to the to the anode and cathode of the device. We can do edge over metallization and photolithography to find the uh, interconnect. So this is basically a strip light that consists of a conventionally sized LED. One way to think about it, split into 100 pieces and then spread out spatially. And that turns out to be very, very important from a standpoint of thermal management. I'll get back to that in a second so we can do lighting on very thin strips of low temperature uh, polymers without burning them up by, by spreading out the thermal load uh, in that way. And we do all the interconnects in one shot, you know, so, so it becomes a scalable fashion. Now, who cares about uh, light emission in the context of the brain? I mean, the brain is an enclosed space. You know, optical activity is not obviously an essential uh, feature of the way the, the brain works. However, uh, the uh, neuroscience community over the last five, six years has developed some really powerful uh, genetic techniques for inducing artificial light sensitivity in specific targeted classes of neural circuits. And what that allows you to do is move away from techniques that have used uh, been used in the past uh, based on electrical stimulation to optical stimulation. That's very, very powerful because now you have genetic targeting of the kinds of cells that you are addressing using optical stimulation, which you previously did not have with electrical stimulation approaches, and you eliminate a lot of the parasitics associated with injecting electrical current into a biological tissue, um, you know, uh, unwanted dual heating, uh, for example. So there are channel rhodopsins, essentially light-sensitive uh, ion channels that get integrated into the cell membrane brains by virtue of this genetic modification such that upon illumination with different colors of light you can either excite or inhibit the action of those cells. And so this, this is completely taking over uh, the field of neuroscience research. So pretty much any paper that's published these days uh, you know, uses these kinds of approaches as opposed uh, to these. Now in spite of the, the, the talent of the neuroscience community in, in the genetic modification and this concept, they're really lousy when it comes to optical engineering it turns out. And so this is the way that it's done uh, and a standard uh, approach is basically use equipment borrowed from the telecommunications industry repurposed for this um, type type of applications. Basically fiber ferrule, optical uh, fiber of silica attached to an external laser source. Light gets piped down that waveguide. The uh, optical fiber itself penetrates down into the depths of the uh, brain to a targeted region and then you just light up the brain in that way. And it it works at some level, but um, the problem is it physically tethers the animal to the external light source. And so what you're trying to do here is light up or inhibit the action of specific neural circuits and then look at the impact on the behavior of the animal to begin to tease out the function uh, of the brain. Um, but the tether changes the natural behavior of the animal. This is a very small animal, a mouse model, and this kind of mechanical uh, and uh, mass load uh, becomes uh, problematic. So, so the concept here was to use these ideas in, in flexible devices and ultra-miniaturized light sources to get rid of the fiber and instead deliver the light source directly you know, in, into the depth of the brain. So take these cellular scale light emitters and instead of the fiber optic, which is actually much, much larger, mount the these tiny LEDs on thin uh, plastic filaments essentially and inject them down into the brain. And these things are so small and so thin you don't have to stop with just the LEDs but you can add temperature sensors, photo detectors, microelectrodes, make a multifunctional system that still uh, you know, can be delivered into the brain. And in this kind of multi-layer stack up you end up with a device that's still maybe 25 microns in thickness, an order of magnitude smaller than the diameter of the uh, fiber optic and in fact so thin that it doesn't offer the kind of bending stiffness you need to penetrate the surface of the brain. And so what we use is a releasable sort of plastic thicker micro-injection needle uh, bonded to this system with a bioresorbable glue. So it allows us to deliver the devices down, then we uh, take, take the needle back out. So it's almost like, a, like an injection process to deliver these devices into the brain. This is what they look like. Uh, very tiny but high performance uh, LEDs on the very thin flexible filaments. This is a device that's threaded through the eye of a sewing needle and sort of wrapped around its shaft just to give you a sense of the very compliant low bending stiffness mechanics associated with these devices. This is what it looks like 
uh, being injected into the brain of an animal. So uh, you remove the, um, uh, the, the skull, expose the surface of the brain. There's a stereotactic apparatus that allows to, in a very precise way, deliver these devices down into the depth of the brain. That releasable microneedle uh, can be pulled back out because the uh, interface uh, adhesive that we're using is bioresorbable. And I'll come back to that bioresorbable comment uh, uh, topic, as, as I mentioned in, in, in the third part of the talk, but, but this is in just a, uh, the context of a passive glue, you can pull it back out. Now you have a multifunctional optoelectronic system down into the depth of the brain, and you have addressing wires coming up out of the brain surface for interfacing to control and uh, pow power systems uh, outside of the uh, animal. So if you think about this, just uh, I mentioned thermal management before, you, you have to worry a little bit because uh, now you have essentially a light bulb uh, in the brain, and the brain has a very limited tolerance to increases in temperature. If the temperature of the brain increases by more than one or two degrees Celsius, you begin to uh, permanently damage uh, the tissue. And, and the question is, how in the world can you operate an LED under those kinds of uh, constraints? And it turns out you can do this, and, and we did a lot of studies before getting anything into in live animals, uh, for three reasons. One is that the LEDs themselves are so tiny, the surface area to volume ratios are huge, and so the passive rates for thermal diffusion are very high. So they tend to run cool, partly uh, because of that. Second, the thermal mass of these devices is also very low. So you have them embedded into a living tissue that has, as a natural part of uh, its structure, um, fluid flows. And so the blood flow itself carries heat away from these devices. It doesn't require a lot of blood flow uh, to pull, pull heat out of these systems. And then the third thing is that you actually operate these devices in a very low duty cycle operation in order to do this optogenetic simulation. So if you take all those three things together, you can do uh, studies in hydrogen gels uh, in anesthetized animals. Using these integ integrated temperature sensors, you can look at the maximum temperature increase as a function of frequency of operation of these devices. And using constitutive uh, properties determined by fitting at a low frequency, you can uh, develop models that are predictive all the way up to high frequencies. And the point is that the maximum change in temperature during operation is about a tenth of a degree. So 10 times lower than the damage threshold. And that, that, that's a very important consequence of the miniaturized geometry and some of the designs here. So you can put all this together. Um, mice are not really large enough animals to accommodate a battery. So you have to think about battery-free approaches to power delivery and control. And the way that we do that is we use um, uh, electromagnetic harvesting. So we have uh, gigahertz frequency antennas in this kind of serpentine geometry to afford soft mechanics. This is a subdermal uh, implant. It connects to an umbilical that uh, delivers power down to the LEDs in the base of the brain. The whole thing is uh, implantable uh, you know, in that way. So this is what it looks like in, in animals. So we have uh, transmitting antennas antenna over here, a uh, bunch of animals uh, mounted up with LEDs and uh, they go about their normal mouse business uh, without any, any uh, apparent effect of um, you know, the, the operation of the LEDs. And in a sense, these mice, I think, have no idea that they have uh, an LED in their brain. <laughs> they kind of uh, you know, do, do their thing. So, so what does this look like in the context of sort of a prototypical you know, optogenetic experiment? Well, here, here it is. So in this case, the, the mice are genetically modified so that their neural circuits um, Upon optical uh, stimulation, uh, produce dopamine, which creates a pleasure response. And so you can train without a physical reward then uh, behaviors in the, these animals. So here's an example of an animal moving around in a Y maze. Uh, they tend to like the endpoints of these uh, mazes. This is untrained. And this is after you uh, operate the uh, LED every time the animal enters this part uh, of the maze for some period of time. And then you stop operating the LED entirely. Um, they, they, they develop an affinity for this part of their uh, environment by consequence of that uh, training, you know, uh, associated with dopamine release uh, induced by operation of the LEDs in that part of the, the maze. So there's lots of other kinds of experiments you can do. You can extend these kinds of um, techniques to multi-LED systems. So we have uh, sort of metamaterial type structures. We can create antennas with multiple resonances. They're connected to different LEDs with different colors. So just tuning the... Um, uh, the frequency of the 
uh, RF illumination that we're providing across the cage. We can light up different LEDs, different parts of the brain, lots of additional things you can do. Instead of just being restricted to the brain, you can use optogenetic techniques now in essentially any part of the animal. Very difficult to do this with a fiber optic cable, as you might imagine. This is a, uh, a device interface with the uh, sciatic nerve. This is with the spine. So you can put opto uh, electronic functionality, not just, just in the brain, but, but really uh, across any part of the uh, body of the animal. So that's uh, electronics, optoelectronics. Let me shift to a little bit more of an exploratory uh, direction uh, for us where, where we think there might be some frontier opportunities. And so just to summarize, you know, I've, I've described things that go on the surface of the brain, point uh, integration at the depth of the brain. Uh, but if you think about, you know, real bio biological systems, they're obviously sort of intrinsically three-dimensional. So if you're just sitting on the surface or you're just probing and interrogating one point in the three-dimensional depth, you're only getting a very tiny fraction of the entire picture of the uh, function of the uh, organism because, you know, the brain consists of, uh, you know, neural networks spread out through three-dimensional space and these kind of open filamentary, uh, you know, 3D architectures. And, and that's sort of a ubiquitous design approach in, in biology. It doesn't apply just to, to neural networks, but also to things like vasculature and so on. It's really, really a 3D system in those kinds of uh, open uh, mesh geometries. And uh, you might think about, you know, whether there are ways to create electronics in, the, in that uh, format. And ideally what you would want to do is, again, try to leverage the most sophisticated forms of electronic and optoelectronic devices that exist today in these kind of planar geometries or in these flexible sheets and somehow configure the system so that when you flip a switch, you could transform geometrically those 3D systems into well-controlled 3D architectures architectures. Like, how, how could you do that? Could you take a, a silicon wafer and somehow configure the thing, flip a switch, and then it would do that geometric tra transformation to create something that would allow a qualitatively higher level of integration, you know, with, with biology. And we've been thinking about that probably for, you know, 10 years. I think probably three years ago, we kind of figured out how to do it. And um, let me just step you through through the ideas, because it turns out to be really, really uh, a lot simpler than, than, than may maybe it initially appeared. And so what we do is we exploit some of the concepts I've referred to up to this point in the talk, and that since we know how to take a silicon wafer with silicon CMOS on it and shave off the active stuff, uh, and we can shave it off either as a uniform sheet or any kind of patterned, um, open, you know, uh, holy uh, uh, sheet or, or mesh. Uh, we, we can do that. And so in this context, I'll uh, describe a very simple case of shaving off of the wafer a thin uh, serpentine filament that has an amplitude that slowly decreases along its length, as illustrated in this green uh, cartoon uh, here. So we've done that. We've taken the wafer, we shaved it off, we have this little filament. We know how to move, move that around and transfer it from one place to another. Separately, we take a silicone uh, elastomer um, that can uh, stretch with elastic mechanics to very long, uh, large strain levels, uh, four or five hundred percent. And so in this case, we just stretch it uniaxially, just stretch it out like that. And then what we do in that stretch state, we functionalize the surface of the silicon so it has exposed hydroxyl groups. Groups. With the filament, we create the same kind of surface functionality, but in a lithographically patterned fashion, illustrated by these red dots here. So now if it's OH functional groups on the silicone substrate on selected regions of this released filament, such that when bringing those two things together, those uh, exposed OH groups react with one another, give off a water molecule, and lead uh, to a covalent bonding at that interface, a strong adhesive bond. And so with this kind of system, now we relax the strain, the pre-stretch in the silicone substrate so it rebounds back to its original length. And in doing so, it applies compressive stresses to this structure. Beyond a certain threshold, the unbonded regions, which are just interacting with the substrate through van der Waals interactions, will delaminate and move up out of the plane and translate and twist in a way that's defined by the pre-strain here, the geometry of this filament, and the positions of these bonding locations, which for this particular case imposes or uh, induces a geometry transformation from this planar serpentine to this 3D conical coil, uh, as I'll show you in the next uh, slide. So this is a finite element modeling.
you know, analysis of that uh, process from uh, several different uh, view viewing angles. So this is a 3D view, so 2D to 3D. So it grows up out of the surface as you relax the pre-strain uh, in the substrate, and uh, you know, it accomplishes that kind of 3D you know, ar architecture. Just very simple example to uh, convey, the, convey the ideas, and I'll show you much more comp complex systems in a second. So we do full 3D uh, finite element modeling of the mechanics. That becomes a critically important design tool. Uh, but in this case, it, it allows us to map the quantitatively the strains in these filaments and in the underlying silicone substrate. And here's a colorized SEM of the results of that process. So a pair of these conical 3D coils in device grade silicon. And this could have any kind of electronic functionality built onto it, predefined before the geometry transformation. But we just show show examples in, in silicon just so you can get, get a sense of it. So you can do all kinds of different coils. You can control the uh, handedness of the coils by controlling the geometry of the precursor. We can do right and left-handed coils. We can do anti-Helmholtz coils, so right to left with an abrupt shift in the handedness at a predefined uh, location. We can also do toroids, so instead of just uniaxial stretch, you can do biaxial stretch and then you know, close these filament, uh, filamentary structures on themselves. So this will generate one toroid, another toroid, and then sort of a funny basket structure in the middle uh, upon release of uh, pre-strain, and you see that happen spontaneously. Again, relaxing pre-strain, geometric transformation, planar to 3D. You know, in that 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 kind of kind of way, and this works in silicon. It's a brittle material, but if you do the design up front, you can avoid any kind of bending strains that would lead to fracture. So you can do this, you know, without defects, as illustrated here. That's the modeling. You get a very very good quantitative uh, quantitative match. Now, if you think about biology, maybe some kind of uh, interconnected mesh, maybe a deterministic design, maybe maybe not. You can do do all kinds of things. This is a sort of a two level structure that consists upon geomet geometric transformation a series of coils that are going in one direction and then another series of coils sitting on top of the first oriented in the orthogonal uh, direction. And you'll see this transformation here. Uh, bonding sites down here, obviously. Uh, and then that's that's a kind of 3D construct you can generate. That's, again, silicon on silicone. This is a cross-sectional view. You see the, the three-dimensionality of these systems. Again, device-grade silicon. It's easy to integrate any kind of device uh, uh, functionality you want you know, on, on, on top top of that, very straightforward. You can scale this down. Uh, it's Newtonian mechanics. It applies down to filaments that are on the order of you know 10 nanometers in thickness. This is 100 nanometers in thickness, 500 nanometers wide in this kind of uh, starfish uh, type, type of shape. But you can do lots of things. Doesn't have to be just filaments. Could be plates and membranes as well. This is kind of an odd uh, structure. This is the 2D precursor. It might not be immediately apparent what that's going to transform into. Um, you know, upon release of the pre-strain of the substrate, but in this case, it really sort of grows up out of the substrate and involves several levels of buckling up out of the uh, out of the plane to form some kind of you know sunfl uh, sunflower jellyfish, you know type type structure. Anyway, there's a huge design space uh, here. That's that structure in silicon. There it is in uh, you know mo modeling uh, results. You can do multi layers, entangled, um, nested structures, all sorts of things. I won't go through through the details. There's a lot of uh, control parameters. Obviously, the 2D layouts and the bonding configuration, thickness profiles. You can define places where you get folds, for example, non-uniform distributions of pre-strain on and on. Anyway, we're doing a lot of things here. I think the, the general question is what is the full range of accessible 3D topologies that are possible with this kind of approach? Don't know the answer to that. Um, can you develop design uh, algorithms that allow you to solve the inverse problem? Here's a 3D structure I want. Okay, the, the algorithm tells me here's the 2D layout you need. You know, a, lot of, a lot of things that, that we don't understand from the process, but there are some basic capabilities here that appear to be useful. So so what do you what do you do with it in terms of a biointegration you know, standpoint. And uh, you know, one possibility is you take these 3D things and you try to smush them into the brain. And probably that doesn't make a lot of sense. Instead, we're thinking about them as uh, scaffolds, essentially uh, frameworks on which you grow cells and, and uh, use the functionality to monitor and uh, you know, control the prol proliferation, the differentiation of the cells. So we're uh, in the front end of that process, but we can grow cells on these 3D silicon mesostructures and we can look at their morphology. We don't have a lot of active functionality here yet. Uh, but that, that's kind of a direction uh, that we're going.
So at this point, I got five minutes left. I'm going to transition and talk to you about that third topic. Uh, but by way of transition, let me um, uh, motivate it in a couple of ways. One is, you know, in the context of this sort of framework or scaffold, you might envision the use of this kind of device in sort of a transient mode. So it's there during the uh, cell growth, but then once you have formed your tissue construct, you might not want the scaffold anymore. And ideally, you could design it such that it's there during that growth process, but then resorbs and disappears afterward to, to eliminate its presence. That, that would be one, one example. The other thing is in the context of bio-integrated devices, implants or um, you know, uh, advanced surgical uh, diagnostics, you really think about things mostly in two time regimes. One is a permanent implant, lasts the life of the patient, and I talked a little bit about these water barriers, that, that becomes a critical issue in that context. The other is integration with biology for a very short time frame, such as a surgical diagnostic in the context of epilepsy characterization. It turns out that there's another opportunity that lies in between those two limits, in which you might want a device inside the body uh, to provide some kind of diagnostic or therapeutic function in the context of of a transient biological process like wound healing. And in that kind of context, you would want the device to be there until the wound is healed, but then you don't want it there any longer because its presence would represent additional device load and risk for the patient. One solution is you do a secondary surgical extraction to remove it. The better solution would be you just design it to be water soluble and biodegradable. You just eliminate itself you know, after, uh, after that functional uh, period. And so that brings me like I said, to this last topic, and I'll, I'll cover it very quickly, just three, five minutes or, uh, here, just to give you a, an idea of what, what we're trying to do. And it falls into a broader area that we're referring to as uh, transient electronics. And so here's the definition. Any kind of electronic system that fully or partly dissolves or resorbs or otherwise physically disappears, disappears at a program rate or triggered time. And so for a bioresorbable device, we're talking about dissolution by hydrolysis or enzymatic action you know, in, in, in the body. Uh, and you can imagine not only sort of these temporary types of implants, but maybe devices you deploy in the environment or maybe you know, eventually consumer electronics made out of eco-resorbable materials to eliminate electronic waste. We've received a lot of funding from the military uh, over time. You can imagine uh, you know, all kinds of devices to eliminate unwanted recovery of sensitive of hardware by an adversary, that, that type of thing. Same notion of uh, transient electronics, but this is the one, one that we're most uh, interested in. And so the, the question becomes, how do you create a water-soluble class of electronics? And as with this sort of flexible stuff I was talking to you before, ideally you'd want to use silicon because you'd be building on a very powerful base of uh, technical capabilities. But uh, to zeroth order, most people think about silicon in the form of a wafer, and you think about it as a rock or a brick in terms of its chemical stability in water. You take a silicon wafer, you drop it into a beaker of water, not, not much happens. But it turns out that uh, not, uh, there, there is something happening, it's just not much, but that not much tends to be important, uh, increasingly so as you miniaturize the dimensions of the silicon structures themselves. And in fact, if you take these silicon nanomembranes that I was talking to you before, uh, about before, and you immerse them in uh, PBS solution, water uh, with some electrolytes, at physiological conditions, it actually disappears on a, a two-week time scale, roughly, due to this reaction. So it's silicon reacting with water to form silicic acid. Very, very slow rate of reaction, but again, you have a very tiny thickness of material. So even ultra slow chemistry becomes critically important in the way you think about the material. So this, this rate of reaction at physiological conditions will reduce the thickness of a silicon plate like that by about two to three nanometers per day. Uh, and so if you start with, you know, 20, 30 nanometer sheet of silicon, that means it's gone, you know, in, in 10 days or, or, or so. And furthermore, silicic acid is a naturally occurring compound in um, uh, the human body already. And, and so it becomes, it becomes a very uh, powerful and interesting semiconductor basis for bioresorbable electronics. Now, of course, you need something more than the semiconductor, right? You need dielectrics, you need conductors, you need substrates, you need capsulation layers. I won't go through the diesel, it's spent a lot of time, but there's a whole uh, portfolio of materials that you can use now to build devices that offer silicon levels of performance, but with this key unique defining feature that all of the constituent materials are bioresorbable and water soluble. This is a coal pits oscillator, the whole thing uh, dissolves away, and this is what it looks like 
you know, under simulated rainfall, this, this is something we produce in response to a, a request from a DARPA program manager. But the point is, you can design these things to dissolve at any rate. In this case, it's dissolving almost immediately upon contact with water. It's a silk fibroin substrate, dissolves very quickly. That's the mechanical support. It takes the magnesium uh, electrode traces with it, dissolve in a few hours, and then the silicon component's gone in a couple of uh, weeks. And so it turns out you can put all those pieces together and begin to build, you know, electronic systems like the ones I was showing you before, but with this uh, bioresorbable uh, characteristic. So that's one of these mapping arrays uh, that I showed you before. Here's uh, one of these devices, but now out of, out of purely bioresorbable materials operating on the brain of a rat in this case. But again, uh, artificially stimulated seizure and, and you can do the mapping. Not quite at the same uh, level of integration I showed you before, but this is kind of where we are with the, with the technology. So you, you can do, you can do reali realistic uh, things with these, these kinds of devices. So with that, I think my time is up, and so I'm just going to uh, conclude with, with an overall summary. So I touched on uh, three topics, each one of uh, which is relevant to uh, research and uh, therapies on the brain, these soft conform conformal electronics and these injectable filaments, this 3D you know, network stuff, the bioresorbable electronics, and it all sort of fits in this mold of you know, doing basic kind of discovery mode research and materials and applied physics, but in the context of uh, you know technologies that we hope you know will have an impact on, on neuroscience research and uh, modern practices in uh, in clinical uh, clinical medicine. So uh, I said at the outside, it's very, outside it's very you know interdisciplinary. So we work with a number of different senior uh, collaborators in engineering science, in neuroscience, and uh, clinical medicine uh, here. Uh, and I want to acknowledge all of those uh, folks. But the most important people are the you know the students and the and the postdocs who do the work. And uh, you know we've been very fortunate to have spectacularly you know talented uh, f uh, students and and so on coming through the group. This is a picture of the group just before we left uh, Urbana for the transition up to Evanston and um, you know these guys do all the work I just get to talk about it so I want to want to show this picture it actually makes the group look quite a bit larger than it really is because this is a family event uh, and that's not a postdoc and that's not a, <laughs> not a grad grad student with that I'll just uh, conclude and, and be happy to answer questions if you have any So you mentioned this a little bit in the LED case, but I was wondering more about the difficulties involved with if you want to have something that's inside a closed skull, as well, like something that doesn't need wires going to the outside world. Yeah. What are some difficulties with both powering and then getting signals to and from a device like that? Yeah, that's a good question. So the devices that we have, they are fully enclosed, not not quite maybe the way you're thinking about, but let me just highlight and remind you exactly the architecture here. It might not have been completely clear from this um, view graph, but but we have the, the probe, so this piece is down into the depth of the brain, right? This then comes out from the surface of the cerebral cortex through a hole in the skull, okay? And then this piece sits subdermally, but on the outside surface of the skull. Uh, and that hole that allows this filament to sort of pass down into the brain is sealed with like a, like a dental cement, essentially, just to feel it fill in the gap. So in some ways, you know, it is fully implantable, but this piece is not, you know, in the intracranial space, just because it doesn't need to be. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's bigger than this, right, physically. So, so that was an architecture that seemed to, to make sense um, to us. Um, th this has the ability for, for wireless power delivery and, by natural extension, wireless control, because I just turn my RF source on and off, right? And so, so this, this does, you know, something, you know, useful in that context. It does not have the ability for wireless data transmission back out. That, that would require a little bit more sophistication in the, in the electronics. We do have systems like that, uh, and they'll be published uh, shortly, but, but they're also uh, battery-free. We think that's a pretty important uh, feature of the, of the platform because it gives you essentially infinite op operating lifetime, and it eliminates all the mass load uh, on the animal. And mice are, are tiny little things, right? So, so battery is difficult, you know, in, in that context. Um, but if you're asking, you know, is it possible to like embed, you know, all the wireless and control, you know, down into this piece? Maybe. I mean, I think the um, the problem is. Um 
you know, the wavelength, the, the operating frequency of the RF, right? So, so in this case, this was um, operating at two gigahertz, and so it allowed us to make a fairly, you know, compact uh, an antenna. But, but this is not anywhere nearly compact enough, right, for for integration on on that type of um, uh, platform. And so, so that that's a problem. I mean, the, the RF wavelengths are, are measured in centimeters, and so your antenna, you know, as it reduces in size, its efficiency drops uh, drops off very quickly so that that that's one problem there there would pro probably need to be some other kind of uh, communication or, or power transfer approach maybe just optically right uh, in the in the near infrared and the red you have pretty good tissue penetration so you can imagine maybe it's kind of photovoltaic type approach you need to deliver pow power optically and maybe an optical uh, link for for transmitting that data back out but at least for this application there's not a big a dis disadvantage in separating the control and the RF electronics from the active probe in the in the brain. That's just the way we do it. I was also gonna, it seems like it would be more difficult with like the epilepsy monitoring one too. Because that one it always seemed to have like a bunch of wires needed to connect to the outside. That's what they do today. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's quite frightening, actually, <laughs> if you think about it. You know, they, they I mean the the skull is open. There are no nerve endings on, on the surface of the brain. To put stuff there, you know, pe people don't, you don't really fe feel it. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the wires wires are coming out. Um, yeah, I mean, I think think data management and wireless uh, uh, data communication that that is an area of opportunity. I mean, maybe a new new f physics you know protocol for for doing that might be required. It's not clear to me how you know RF is is going to scale. But you know the you know human skull is just a lot more space, right? So, so there's a lot more you know uh, functionality. You can accommodate you know antennas a lot more easily than you can in an animal like this. But but I think power and um, data communication th those are the two sort of Technology challenges where you know progress could be made, and this this is kind of what we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so for the uh, complex challenges where you're stretching out the mm -hmm. straight frontier on, um, and then you know, so you can get these complex three mm -hmm. geometries. Mm -hmm. um, you know how you can get like you can control the spiral and uh, have like anti helmets Yeah, mode, yeah, yeah, mode. yeah. So essentially, those are like little antenna, right? Yeah. You could yeah. Power through the yeah. precise control. Yeah. 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 I know it's interesting. You can create magnetic fields. You can do magnetic manipulation. You can create kind of 3D antennas to address this compact uh, size uh, issue. So we've done done some of that. You can also make, you know, sort of just filament. They they become like really useful, like springy interconnects. Like, you know, in terms of like uh, electronic system, you can connect components. Yeah, a lot a lot of different things you can you can do with those coils. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so these LEDs that we're using are pretty bright. Mm -hmm. um, do you foresee any way of targeting uh, these LEDs, uh, like the signals to specific populations? Well, yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the the targeting is done at the level of the channel rhodopsin. So, so that's at a genetic level of specificity, and uh, it's decoupled from the optical illumination because the unmodified cells are not responsive to the light at all. So it's not as though we're trying to take these tiny um, LEDs and position them next to you know small collections of cells that we want to light up. We're lighting up a, a volume. The um, propagation uh, length for um, uh, photons in the blue is about a half a millimeter. So we're lighting up a sphere that has a radius of half a millimeter. <laughs> and any light sensitive cell within that region is, is getting activated, right? So, so the specificity is not so much on the um, you know, control from the optic side, but, but more from the, the genetic you know, cell, cellular level side. Now, maybe there's a way to, to um, you know, use, use more sophisticated approaches in light shaping and focusing and you know, maybe a holographic manipulation of the wave fronts coming out of the LED. It's not a coherent light source, but we haven't done a lot along those lines. It could could be an interesting uh, area for investigation. But the challenge is once once the photons leave the uh, light source, you're not controlling them. They're they're off and doing their thing. You know, so it's hard to you know do do that kind of targeting for for that reason. The visual consensus of these are fairly broad, so yeah, you only have a few different signals. 
right? That's right. Yeah, if you look at the the spectral um, absorption features associated with these channel rhodopsins, nominally they are active at different. They have peaks at different wavelengths throughout the visible range, but but those peaks are overlapping. So it turns out that all the you know, there's a lot of work going on in the biology community to create channel rhodopsins that are sensitive at different wavelengths. But then you look at, at the overlapping you know absorption features. You can light them all up with a blue LED, you know, just with different efi uh, efficiencies. So I think the biologists like to think about, oh, I'm going to you know, hit the red ones with my red photons, I'm going to hit the blue ones with my blue photons, but the blue photons are hitting everything. You know? So, so may maybe there's, there's a possibility of narrowing those spectral features, but, but um, and in fact, we're trying to, dis you know, we're, we are distributing these devices. There's a lot of inbound interest in the neuroscience community for these devices. We have a tiny little company. We're not making any money, but just to supply them to the to the community. And uh, you know, we get calls. You know, we want the the red LED. We want the we want the green LED, not the blue LED. We tell them, look, the blue is going to work just like that. <laughs> it's like, no, no, we want the green one, right? So there's a, a little bit different mindset, right? So, um, but, the, but that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a big concern for the LEDs because there's just a lot of power consumption there, and even a very efficient LED, most most of the power is ending up as heat. So, so that's probably the most daunting uh, thermal management issue we've had to kind of take a look at. The um, the electronics that we're using for those uh, mapping arrays, um, you know, they're, they're not operating at high frequencies, they're not operating at high power, they're basically just voltage controlled switches, it's just a matrix of switches so we uh, eliminate the need for, you know, a lot of the wiring uh, that would otherwise be required. So we do, you know, IR imaging of, you know, thermal distributions of these devices in operation, but there's not, not any significant heating in, the, in those sheets. Um, now there could be, you know, you add a radio functionality we were talking about before, then, then you really have to start, start uh, considering the, those things. We, we just haven't had to grapple with it and probably their, you know, materials approaches and heat spreading and th things like that or ways to operate the device to avoid, you know, excessive heating and so on. So it's, a, it's an important issue, but, but we've only had to focus on it, uh, you know, in the context of the LEDs so far. Yeah. So you mentioned that in the case of like the epilepsy treatment, you can uh, get much more accurate sensing of the activity tools to determine you know what part of the brain to remove. Um, would it be possible to use similar devices to actively yeah, 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 yeah. It's really interesting. So uh, this company Neuropace got um, FDA approval for a device. It's not a mapping array, but but it's just a few point contact electrodes. And so so they they map electrical activity. This is normally what what they say they do. They map electrical activity, and then you stimulate in a way that eliminates the seizure. And you know there are similar kinds of opportunities in addressing arrhythmias uh, in the heart. Cause a lot of the electrical patterns are similar at some some level, right? So being able to map and then stimulate uh, allow you to think about sort of engineering approaches to treating disease that could complement those that are traditionally addressed with pharmaceutical approaches, so the chemistry approach and be more of an engineering approach. And so I think that's a really powerful frontier area for the whole community is to think more about bioelectronic medicines as opposed to pharmacological medicines. And uh, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of things happening in that that, in that space, because it's the brain, it's the heart, and then the entire peripheral nervous system, right, can, can be controlled electrically. You stimulate, you can inhibit, uh, you can target the function to specific organs. There's something conceptually more, more appealing about that idea of treating disease than taking a pill where you have the chemistry just goes everywhere, right? In this case, you have an engineered device and you place it where you need it on the nerve that you know is controlling your... So so I think it's uh, it's going to be a pr pretty cool area, you know, for, for the next, you know, 10, 20 years or so. Yeah. 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 So in your definition for transient electrons, you mentioned not only the thing that will dissolve it, but also 
Twitter? Yeah. The yeah. How would you go about Well, it's a good question. So we publish one paper along those. So to take a step back, for most biomedical applications, you don't need it. <laughs> you know, you just need you just engineer the device to last maybe two, three times longer than you think you're going to need it, and then the time scale over which it dissolves and resorbs in the body is not a critical. There, there's no need for a specific triggering event, and there's no need for super fast dissolution either. So, so it hasn't triggered transient has not been a focus of ours for that reason. It's not needed, but the military wants it. Absolutely has to have it, right? <laughs> and so we have thought about it a little bit in that context. I would say so we've worked with sort of uh, you know polymers chemists there are ways to um, you know induce depolymerization of a polymer substrate by exposure to light uh, and then it will fall apart into small molecule constituents which will sublime so you're not triggering the disintegration of the device components the active materials but you're you're kicking the legs out of the substrate and then and then you're just left with tiny things that just fall apart into sand right so we, we've done things like that um, the other approach when we publish it, it's a little bit ugly but at least you know it kind of works is that is that you can build sort of microfluidic structures next to your device and those microfluidic chambers can contain etchants and then you can trigger the release of the I mean it's you know it's a little ugly but it like I said it basically works so so you can do things like that I there's probably more clever approaches, but we, like I said, we haven't spent a lot of time on it. I think it's it's cool to think about it. Maybe maybe, maybe somebody else has some some good ideas, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, biofluids being an issue. Yeah. Some of these devices. How exactly do you combat that? Well, like I said, I mean, I think I stepped through the beginning part of the talk, and we, we published our per first paper in 2011, which means that we were probably starting that project around 20, like 2009, so like way back at this point. And um, we got stuck because uh, if you think about like a, a pacemaker or um, other, like a cochlear implant, different things that exist today as uh, chronic implants, they put all of their, their electronics in a ceramic um, can or, or titanium can, uh, right, where the, where the walls of the can are maybe three, four millimeters in thickness. They screw it down and that's it. And uh, they do that because, you know, it's, a, it's an effective way to keep the biofluids out. And unfortunately, we can't use that approach because, you know, three millimeters of titanium and then we don't have a flexible de device anymore, right? So it really has to be something that uh, you know is on the order of a, a micron in thickness to give the kind of bendability that we need. And uh, every material that we've ever looked at that um, you know, you deposit, um, you know, into films of that thickness inevitably has uh, some pinhole defects, just just structural imperfections, or you're depositing this material on a heterogeneous substrate that has topography associated with the devices, and it doesn't completely cover cover the edge or whatever, all kinds of different things. Because one failure across a several centimeter square uh, area of electronics and you're done. I mean, it just takes one pinhole and it's over. There, there are very specific compliance levels around how much leakage current uh, you know you can tolerate. Uh, and so the question is, how do you get a macroscopically perfect biofluid barrier that can last? I mean, our aspiration is like a thousand years, so ten times longer than the oldest you know lifespan for you know realistic. So, so that 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 turns out to be uh, pretty hard. So, so you know, like I said, we kind of grappled with that for five or six years, what we ended up settling on is basically we take a silicon wafer, it's a spectacularly you know, sophisticated piece of materials technology, very, very flat surface, structurally perfect in, in terms of single crystal. Then you can grow a thin layer of glass on top of it, growing. So you're exposing the oxygen, reacting with the exposed silicon, and you can grow thin films of SiO2. And then you get rid of the substrate, you have a very, very perfect thin layer of glass, and you can basically cap your device with that. I mean, there are a lot of details there, but, but you can do that, and it's it's absolutely perfect, and it lasts for, for very, very long periods of time. Limited only by the fact that uh, the silicon dioxide itself is transient, but at a much, much slower rate than silicon. So a half a micron of SiO2, this kind of dense, thermally grown SiO2 will last about 50 years. So um, anyway, that, that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned about the use of silicon nanoribbons yeah. as a stretchable material inside the uh, yeah. brain. Yeah. So I was wondering about the possibility of using graphene nanoribbons, which I believe is no more uh, semi-metallic 
and is much more flexible than uh, Yeah, well, a few comments on that. You know, one is nobody knows how to make uh, graphene nano ribbons at length scales that open up a, a gap. Uh, in any kind of scalable way. So I think there was a group at Stanford, they sonicated and they fished around, they found a couple of ribbons and published a science paper and then <laughs> moved on, you know. Uh, that That's one, there, there's really no practical way to make those ribbons. Uh, and then the other thing is I think, you know, experimentally and even theoretical models are showing that, you know, as you, you make the graphene thinner and thinner, as you may mentioned, at some point it's no longer semi-metal, it's a semiconductor, but then, uh, Boundary scattering begins to dominate. So now you have a semiconductor material, but it's crappy, you know, in terms of the, the transport characteristics. So um, I think tremendous dollars were wasted on graphene, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> That's my opinion, at least for as, as a semiconductor material for integrated circuits, you know. So it was a good playground for a while, but I think mo most people mo moved away from it. You know, and in terms of, um, you know, the mechanical properties, it is. Um, better than silicon in the sense that, you know, I think the tensile, you know, in it, perfect graphene, I think Jim Hone published a paper, maybe it's 10, 20 percent or something like that. You could stretch it before it, it fractures. But if you think about like a real system, it's not just the semiconductor, right? You have a dielectric, you have a substrate, you have an encapsulation layer. And so we typically put the silicon in the kind of neutral mechanical plane of the overall multi-layer stack. So when we bend our systems, um, the semiconductor layer is not seeing much in terms of strain anyway. And uh, the ultimate bendability is not defined by the semiconductor layer, but the layers that are away from that neutral mechanical plane, like the uh, gate dielectric or the inner layer dielectric or the thin film metallization that's doing the interconnect. So I think both of the things that you said are true. Uh, but I think they have very little impact on, on how you think about uh, the system level design. Yeah. Yeah. We better finish up. Yeah. Yeah.